Okay. So today we're going to continue with the idea of Tachnun, and uh, I guess with the help of the questions yesterday after the class, it's very appropriate uh, to get into this discussion. This discussion is basically uh, sort of what we said yesterday, which is that there isn't a proper form uh, for the for the Tachanun because uh, each generation and each community had uh, different needs. So, um, so that's basically what this. Uh, paragraph is about. So despite its great virtue, the Chachamim did not establish Nefilat Apayim to be an obligatory prayer, and they did not institute a set wording for it. Anyone who so desired would add prayers of supplication and prostration after reciting the Amidah, perhaps specifically because of its superior value, being that it expresses total submission to the Creator may be blessed. It is befitting that it emanates from the heart, from one's most inner resolve. So when it's an obligatory prayer like the Amida, uh, obviously we have to have proper wording because that way we can express the needs of the community. But um, but the uh, Tachanun is more personal. And we did conclude yesterday, it, it was in the comments, so I'll just repeat it now, that almost all the verses and prayers that we say in the Tachanun, especially the ones of Monday and Thursday, uh, are specifically about the nation. So the restoration of Jerusalem and the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem and the gathering of the people. And we did quote a verse uh, that it says, that it's a little bit of a change of the verse, but it's, that people have, the uh, other nations have treated us like the some people treat an impure person or thing. So... And yeah, they probably related to us more like a thing than a person, but but that's really what Monday and Thursday Tachnun specifically is. During the period of the Geonim, a permanent wording for Nefilat Apayim and the prayers of supplication after the Amida began to take shape in the time of the Rishonim, so the, the, the rabbis that were already uh, establishing the Halacha, uh, the wording became established until all Jews accepted upon themselves the obligation to recite certain specific supplications. Like we said uh, yesterday, the Ashkenazi Jews chose uh, Psalm 6, Tehillim uh, Shevav, and the Sephardim Psalm 25. Uh, seemingly as a result of the suffering of the diaspora, which continued to intensify, our hearts were dulled. This necessitated the introduction of a permanent wording of supplication. Because of the Nusach of the supplication, became widespread only after the scattering of the exiles, the differences between the Sephardic and Ashkenazic wording are more pronounced. Um, one day we'll talk a little bit about the history, about even how uh, the rabbis got from uh, Babylon to Europe and North Africa. Um, but just a very short story. Uh, there were five Gonim on a, on a boat and pirates took it over. They realized that these uh, men who are Torah scholars are not going to be able to do much slave uh, physical labor, uh, but they realized that these are Jewish rabbis, and so they sold them to the highest bidder, uh, to whichever community they camped their stolen ship. And so that's that's the scattering of the exiles. The Nefilat Apayim prayer expresses heartbreak manifested by the submission of one's body and sacrifices of one's soul. Therefore, it is not recited on holidays or days of joy due to the celebration of a spe special mitzvah like Brit Milah, the circumcision. And the Kabbalists, the Kabbalists explain that all the tikkunim, rectifications performed on regular days via the Nefiat Apayim prayer, are achieved on days of mitzvah, celebrating purely through the joyous sanctity of the day. So we don't only know how to reach uh, elevated uh, spirit through um, sadness and through um, begging to God, but also through um, joyous occasions. And of course, uh, we still break the glass at our wedding to make sure that we don't forget Jerusalem, don't forget the temple being destroyed. But um, that is the beauty of Judaism, that we know how to elevate ourselves closer to Hashem through tears or through laughter. And that's what I personally believe. Uh, there's, there's actually a uh, an interesting uh, comp comparison between Purim and Tisha B'Av, even though they don't fall on the same day of the week and they don't they don't have the same message, 
the Talmud in, in Megillah says that Mishinichnas Adar Marbim Bismcha, we have to make yourself more happy. And Mishinichnas Av Mematim Bismcha. So my brother jokingly, I think jokingly, uh, said that the saddest day of the year is the, the 29th of Tammuz because uh, that's when you start making your yourself less happy. So, um, sorry, the most the most happy day of the of our year cycle is the 29th of Tammuz because that's when we're supposed to make ourselves uh, less happy. Additionally, when those celebrating such a joyous mitzvah are present in the synagogue, prayers of supplication are not recited as explained in Halachot 7 and 8. And so, we'll, like I said yesterday, we'll get to that at the end of which mitzvah specifically uh, we added bar mitzvah. Uh, we have already learned that in principle there is no obligation to recite Tachanun, and therefore in any situation in which there is doubt as to whether Tachanun should be said, the instruction is not to recite it. Similarly, in a house of mourning, it is customary not to recite Tachanun, since the divine att attribute of judgment means that the deen is already present there, and care should be taken not to amplify it. Uh, and in the cases where people sit shiva, or sorry, uh, say the, the prayers in the shul instead of at their house, uh, we also cancel Tachnun in the shul because uh, their presence is, is this idea of the attribute of, of judgment. The idea behind this is that the person praying the Fiat Apayim demonstrates to himself that his existence is dependent on Hashem and that he is null and void in relation to him. Since a mourner already has an acute sense of this, it is unnecessary to add to it. So I just wanted to point out one thing, and we'll that, with that we'll end. Um, when it says here in this last sentence about his, uh, this is one of those prayers that uh, almost all the rabbis that I ever heard talk about say that it's specifically for men. Women who, who pray, that's a beautiful thing, and we said that they have to pray once a day. But I don't think that any rabbi that I ever heard um, said that uh, a woman is obligated to add the tachanun to her prayers. Um, and there probably is many different reasons, but the reason I'm thinking, and my mother who will listen later will probably write me an email about it, is that women are already more spiritually elevated, and so they don't need to express these tears and, and, and sadness about different things uh, not even their their own sins because because they're already more connected uh, to Hashem. So I think in this case, uh, instead of translating their existence, uh, I think it's appropriate to say his existence, uh, his not capital H, because we're talking about uh, a man who's praying these prayers. And so, uh, and I think in some most of the openers uh, they skip it unless. Uh, there's a minion of men who want to say Tachnun. Um, anyway, so we'll, we'll end with that and we'll open up for questions.